Okay, well, um, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the to the first national webinar for the RACI uh, Careers uh, Outreach Program. Um, today, we're going to be talking about networking. Now, for many people, uh, networking is akin to public speaking. They would just as rather uh, they would just as rather uh, you know be at a funeral in the coffin rather than speaking at it. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people really struggle with the idea of walking into a room full of strangers and making effective connections. But the thing about a network is that it's much more than simply the issue of finding job opportunities. A, a, a network is one of your greatest business assets, even right from the beginning of your career. It's all about, yes, it's job opportunities, but it's also about once you've got your job, it's about finding the business opportunities, the cross fertilization of ideas. It's finding and accessing resources that will support you to do your job well. And most importantly, it's about trust because we live in a complex world where the, 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 the availability of information is not the challenge. The challenge is, how do I make a good business decision quickly? And a good network can be a big part of helping you by going out and saying, well, what, did, what, are, what are people I know and trust? What did they do when they were faced with the same situation? What did they learn? What went well and what didn't went well? So for our discussion tonight, I'm joined by two career professionals, both of whom are participants in the, in the RACI mentoring program. Uh, Dr. Gary Day has built his entire career around networking. Uh, it's a fundamental skill that has supported multiple sales roles at well-known companies such as Perkin Elmer, Sigma Aldrich, and currently Merck, the Merck Group. Um, he holds an MBA in project management and marketing as well as a PhD in chemistry. Uh, at the other end of her career, Kim Scroggie joins us from the, um, the Young Chemist Group uh, in South Australia. I've actually met Kim multiple times uh, at, at networking events that she has arranged and hosted down in Adelaide. Um, Kim is just uh, approaching the end of her PhD and congratulations on that, Kim. It must be very exciting for you, uh, studying organic synthesis and chemical biology at, uh, at Flinders. So welcome to you both. So um, I I thought what we would do tonight is just have a general chat about the issues associated with marketing. And, and I guess I'll start by saying my opening comments about the value of a, of a network. What are your thoughts there? We'll start with you, Gary. Um, incre incredibly invaluable. I'm not a huge fan of social media as a rule, but I love LinkedIn. I've managed to link up with people I knew from years ago. I knew people who just come to me and family on LinkedIn. And you, that's a good way to actually create business-related networks. But I would imagine most people who are part of this now would have Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever. Uh, and they, even those sorts of networks are valuable as well. Because over time, different people move into different areas of their careers and you move with them. And then you know somebody in certain companies, certain level, who may be able to help you get something done. Absolutely. And Kim, you must already have a substantial network by now. Uh, yes, it's been building a lot in the last couple of years, actually, as I've been working a bit harder to try and get it going. But um, I definitely agree with Gary. LinkedIn is one of those things that I first off, when I heard about it, I, like, I don't really know, but um, you'll be surprised if you're not on LinkedIn, you're probably one of the few, most people are, and you will find that anyone you're looking for is probably on there. There's also some headhunters. So if you are looking for a job, they might find you through that. Yeah. Well, it's, actually worth, it's, it's worth noting that when I do recruitment, one of the things I do is I look at a person's LinkedIn profile and I'm not looking for, um, you know, basically a repeat of their resume. What I'm doing is I'm looking at who are their connections. Has this person gone out and made themselves a network? Have they shown the foresight while they've been studying to prepare for the career that's going to come? Yeah. Yeah, and also then if you see a connection that someone that you know that knows me, you can also go and talk to them about me, myself, and see what am I like and find out those type of things. Am I going to fit in with your business? Do I have the right personality? Do I also have the skills? Is what's on my LinkedIn actually what <laughs> you're going to get? Or yeah, and start? certainly to, to jump ahead to a, to a point that I would have touched on much later in this piece, but given that you're two months out from, from finishing your PhD, it's around about now, if you haven't already done it, that you will be putting a post on LinkedIn saying, I'm coming up to graduation. If anybody hears about a job opportunity, I'd love to hear from you. 
yep, this is actually the next two weeks for me is trying to work out what I what I'm actually wanting to do, who I want to go work for, and do I want to travel overseas to go somewhere else, or do I want to go to Australia? So, yes, you're very right. That will be in the next month and a half worth of my time that I'll be <laughs> putting that out there for people, and hopefully somebody has something that's available. Absolutely. Well, let's start with the, the simple, the psychology of networking. Okay. The first and biggest hurdle for a lot of us, you know, I mean, let's face it, as scientists, most of us aren't alpha personalities. So the first and biggest hurdle is just the issue of how do I walk into a room full of strangers? How do I make that big step without fe feeling ex excessively nervous? Kim, you're closest to you. You've been doing it, the, 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 you're newest to it. So why don't we start with you? What, you know, what, what do you do in your head to let you get started? Um, I like to remind myself that whoever I'm going to talk to was in my position, whether that be two years ago or 30 years ago or 60 years ago. And I am quite, like, I do get quite nervous. I don't really enjoy public speaking in exactly as what Dave said. I'd rather be in the coffin. Um, but yeah, I just try to remind myself that, you know, they were in my position, they understand, and hopefully they will be nice enough to <laughs> just have a chat with me. Even if nothing comes from it, at least they'll be nice enough to just have a discussion and I can talk to them about something. But yeah, and if there's a beer on offer, I like a little bit of liquid courage as well. That always helps a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Gary, you would do some sort of networking event at least every month, I would assume. Yes. <clears throat> Just to add to what Kim was saying too, you have to remember that people go to networking events to meet people. So they don't, it's not like you're going out on the dating scene trying to pick up somebody. Um, or this is, this is an event where people are actually there to meet you. So don't be afraid to walk up to them and have a chat. <clears throat> yeah. And names are great. Yeah. <clears throat> It's also worth adding that, you know, some people fear networking, not just because of the public speaking part, but because they th see it as somehow mercenary, that they're doing something wrong or a little bit wrong by networking. But it's really not the case because good networking and good networks are about reciprocity. It's about giving and sharing. Um, and, and therefore, you know, that classic one plus one equals three for extremely large values of one. Uh, yeah, on that, I think it's it's important as well when you go into the room, know what your what your skills are and what you could give to that person. And even if they don't provide you with anything, you give something to them. In time, that will come back around at some stage. It might not be through that person, but it might be through someone who's in their network. And you just have to be willing to give. At the beginning, you have to give a lot, and you won't get much back. But as you as your network builds and you progress further in your career, you'll see that those things will start coming back and it might be years from now, but eventually something will come back. Yeah, but I, I can even guarantee you it'll come back a lot sooner than that. Uh, if you have a good network as you approach graduation, you are far more likely. Statistically, they've run the numbers. Um, the, most, the most common place for a recent graduate to find a new job is through a network. Um, okay, so Gary, what do you do to prepare yourself before you go to a networking event? What, 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 what materials or otherwise do you, do you, do you take with you? Um, <clears throat> sorry, as I mentioned earlier, my voice is not quite right tonight. Um, <clears throat> what I take with me, um, sometimes a note-taking device is useful, but usually they, it comes in the form of my phone and the notes section of the phone. And I make little notes to myself off to the side when I'm away from people. Um, because I've been doing this quite a while now, as people might be able to tell from the colour of my beard and hair. Um, I'm not as nervous as I was. I was terrible when I was an undergraduate student. I was really, really nervous, afraid. Um, it's just got to remember why you're going to this thing. What do you want out of this? Is it just to have a drink and meet a couple of people? Do you have a goal of connecting with somebody who might be able to steer in a direction? Maybe later on, give you some career advice. But also it depends on the type of event you're attending as well. Absolutely. So that's a good point, Gary. Types of events. Where do you most like to, to network? 
I've been trying in the last couple of years to do more with the RACI um, events. Um, we've got a great track record of, of actually getting to them. Tomorrow I'll, I'll travel quite a bit, but I tend to choose things for me work related, which can help in my career, but also help in the company that I work for and it helps me to justify to my organization actually showing up and doing these things, even though it might be on my own time. <clears throat> Absolutely. Kim, what about you? How do you choose the events that you go to? I guess that's a little, it's a bit of a harder question in Adelaide because there's a, 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 a smaller range of events available. Yeah, currently at the moment, because we don't have so many events, I look at my calendar. If I don't have something more important, I generally just go to them. <laughs> and I'm starting to build my net, network. So at the moment, the more I get out there, the better it is for me. Okay. Um, some time, so I just take it from there. <laughs> Absolutely. I will say personally, what I try to do is I try to pick smaller events rather than larger events. So I'd rather go to a, to a small symposium than to a large conference um, because it's a bit like being a shark with a, with a, a school of bait fish. You know, um, if there's lots and lots of people milling around, it's much harder for me to decide who I want to speak to. In a smaller, more intimate event, I can go to the organiser and say, hi, I'm new here and I'm interested in this. Who do you recommend I speak to? And there's a decent chance that not only will they tell me who I should speak to, but they'll probably walk me across the room and introduce me to, to whomever they're talking about. So it's, it's much more intimate. It's much easier to get that, that start as I walk through the door. Uh, the other thing I would say, and of course, Gary, no, Gary and I know this because we have done it on more than one occasion, is that I always try to go for events that have exhibitors rather than just panelists and speakers. Because when everybody, when all the attendees troop off into the darkened room to go and listen to someone speak, I stay outside and I network with the exhibitors themselves. When they have nothing better than to do the, in the world to do than talk to me. And God knows Gary has spent many a quiet hour chatting to me uh, as, as an exhibitor. <laughs> so. Yes, it's, it's a common thing. Um, that's not to say you don't attend the some of the talks, but yes, there's quite a lot of downtime um, when you're exhibiting at conferences and symposia. So it's quite a good chance to wander around, have a chat to other people and get to know them, even though there might be old competition. And if they are, that's a good reason to actually get to know them. And of course the point goes, and I'm sure you would back me on this, Gary, that you as a salesperson who is exhibiting at an event, um, well, firstly, you make your money during the break times when everybody's milling around. That's, that's when you make the connections that are going to make you the money and get you the return on, on, on your, the payment that you've made to be an exhibitor. But in between times, you've got lots of spare time to chat. Um, but the, the, the point that I would make is that you're an excellent person to network with because as a salesperson, you know everyone. <laughs> Yeah, you, you get to know the same people tend to show up at similar sorts of events over time and you get to know them and it's a good way of finding out industry information you otherwise wouldn't get to. All right. So as an exhibitor, when, when young Kim comes up and has a chat to you and, uh, and you take her business card and, uh, and uh, afterwards she links with you on LinkedIn or sends you an invitation on LinkedIn, do you accept that invitation? I would. If I've taken a business card, I've shown interest in the person. And I'll, I definitely would, but I'm very discerning. I get a lot of uh, requests from people overseas on LinkedIn, which I tend to ignore. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and then uh, uh, Kim maintains that relationship with you. Now, obviously, early in her career, the, the, there's a limit to how much Kim can offer you. Like, you know, she's unlikely to go out and, well, I mean, I'll go back one. When you were, wor uh, when you were working at Perkin Elmer and you were selling instruments that were going to cost $30,000 plus, it's unlikely that Kim was going to buy one of those. But nonetheless, you would still have been interested in, in networking with the right people because you know that one day as her career grows, she's going to be in that position. Am I more or less right? Agree, but also she might go out and cure cancer, so you want to know those people too. <laughs> Absolutely. And so early in the career, Kim comes to you and says, you know, I'm looking for a position and you've heard about something and you, you, you introduce it to her, you pass on the message, you know, I've heard about an opportunity here or there. What is it that you want in return from Kim? Nothing. It's just, it's just an offer. If, if I hear something and I can help out, I will. 
All right. So let's turn it completely around. Kim, you've been organising events. You've been organising particularly careers-oriented events for, what, three years now at uh, the YCP down in Adelaide. Yes. You've met any number of industry professionals down in your part of the world. Tell me about the relationship that you've developed with some of those people. Uh, well, I guess the, the biggest thing is that I never know when I'm going to see them again, but they always pop up at other events. And then because I met them at one other networking event, I can always go talk to them. And the biggest thing I've found is that they know other people at that event. And if you have a good relationship with them and you're friendly with them, they will then introduce you to other people. So currently the biggest benefit for me has been them helping me build my network. And I'm taking a lot and not giving very much besides being nice and friendly to them, but it's working out well for me and hopefully, in a later period in my career, I will be able to give back to them. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, Kim, are there any phrases or icebreakers that you use when you're approaching a group of people? Not really. <laughs> I don't really have anything in particular. Generally, I try to move myself closer to that group and overhear conversation. Normally there's more than one person in a group they're already discussing something. And if you're at a networking event, it's generally something you're probably going to be interested in. And then if I have something to say, I can throw myself in. I can put my little two bobs worth in and then introduce myself at the end of that. And then you've introduced yourself to a range of people and yeah, that's pretty much how I would go about it. And if it's one on one, I just say, G'day, how are you today? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's a perfectly reasonable approach. What about you, Gary? How do you, how do you start a conversation with someone you don't know when you're not standing at a booth? Um, often, the reason I like name tags is it actually will have where um, somebody is from. And given I've been at, at a bar quite a bit now, I can look at the institution and then ask questions about the role in the institution that they're up to and use that as an icebreaker in your conversation going, and I work for a company that's fairly well known in the chemical industry, so people will see my company name and then ask big questions in return. Absolutely. Absolutely. One tip I would throw in for young people is, of course, a really great way of growing an early conversation. You know, you, you, you made your icebreaker, but one great way, great way of growing an early conversation is to ask questions about the person and their career. Right, so I've met, I meet Gary and I say, oh, you work at Merck, I'm really interested, tell me what you do, tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like, that sort of stuff. You know, how did you get to where you are? Now the point is twofold. Number one, it gets the person talking about themselves and God knows people love to talk about themselves. But <laughs> secondly, a lot of young people, and uh, this may not apply to you, Kim, but a lot of people, um, young people, are uncertain as to what they actually wanna do after they graduate. And the great thing about going to lots of different people and asking them about their job is the day will come, and I've seen it again and again, where you suddenly get this inspiration and you say, wow, that sounds awesome. That's what I want to do. Right? And it can be a great way, it can be a great way of helping give you some focus, some direction when you decide to go out and search for a career. Because you can't go and apply for every job. You have to start figuring out which job you want to apply for. Kim? How much has that applied to you so far? <laughs> um, definitely talk to people about them. So I had an academic at Adelaide who I'd really, I'd met maybe four or five times and I'd really struggled to hold a conversation with him. And I met with him two weeks ago and I just asked him about him and the conversation went for about an hour and a half. That worked <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> and now I know enough about him that next time I meet with him, I'll be able to start a conversation from that. So yes, that definitely works. Um, on the career -y stuff, mm, it doesn't, it doesn't really, yeah, I mean, I don't know what I want to do. I'm not sure if I want to continue in academia and continue on and do a postdoc or if I do want to move into industry. So at the moment for me, I'm just putting my, my feelers out there. So exactly what you say is talking to people about what they do and then I might find out something that is quite interesting and I go home and follow up on that and who knows, maybe that will be what I decide to do for my career, but currently right now, not sure. So hopefully that works for me. Well, actually I'm very interested, Gary, what role did networking play in you 
in your early career? Um, when I finished my PhD, unemployment in Australia was about 12%, so there were no jobs. And so I had to hit up my supervisors for advice on what to do. And what I did was do postdocs overseas. So I used, I used them and they tapped into their networks to give me an introduction to people overseas as to how I can do a postdoc. And as a result of that, I went to New Zealand, US, and it was about three years worth of living overseas before I came back to Australia. And he gave me introductions to research overseas and the amount of money they have versus here where we really don't have a lot. So, but I used the degree to travel, but the network helped me do that. Absolutely. Well, it's actually interesting. I mean, I got my start. Uh, I, I, I went on holiday for a couple of months at the end of university. I came back, I called my university and said, have you heard about any jobs that are going? And they said, this company needs warm bodies. I said, great, I'm hot stuff. It's a match. And, and that was the beginning of my career. So, uh, so uh, you know, arguably the university was my network just as it was for you, Gary. Interestingly though, I did very little networking at the very beginning of my career. And I would say that my early career lacked any form of shape because I didn't know what I didn't, did or didn't want. I just sort of, I followed, I followed whatever meandering path was open before me without thinking about the options. Um, so I'm going to be very interested, Kim, um, you know, to, to watch your decision-making process over the months that come. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's see. <laughs> um, so, okay, Kim, you've been doing some, um, you've been doing some uh, uh, activities for three years. What are some good questions that another student has asked you or that, you know, that could ask you that would make you sit up and take notice when they, when they come to your events? Um, I think the student that made me take notice the most was one who came to discuss with me a, a project that uh, he thought my research group might be interested in but wasn't something that we actually do. Now, obviously, I'm not the person in my research group which decides which projects we work on, but it did open up interesting conversations and he did very well. <laughs> like we, it was an easy thing for him to come up with like an idea. He just, he probably thought about it before he came and he probably used it on multiple people, but it's an interesting idea. It was simple. I could stand there and think about it in that time. And then we had a whole discussion. For it. So I think that was easily the best one that someone's used to ask me what to talk to me about. Excellent. What about you, Gary? My, sorry, I'm approached quite a lot at, at events purely on the basis of where I work and who I work for. And so students, academics are not afraid to come up and ask questions on me. And it tends to be, uh, they've got a really cool idea, they get really cool research, they want something from me. And so that, that tends, tends to be a bit of one way in some, in some respects. But, but um, <clears throat> what I'm finding generally is that um, students across the board are, I want to say they're smarter, certainly they're more aware of the career beyond being studying and thinking more in longer term. And I was like you, I sort of wandered along. I've been working three years before I decided I didn't want to work in academia anymore. So then I was 15 years doing laboratory work, got sick of that, eventually fell into sales. So I've been doing that for 10, 12 years now. So no real planning, but I um, can't say that it's hurt me, but that's not the same for everybody. <clears throat> so, uh I think there's a lot more awareness about the career and and um, people come up and ask about opportunities within MERC, not just here but overseas as well. And mm -hmm. I've gone to the trouble to find out what's available because I know there's more questions like that coming. Yeah, I, I, I am put somewhat into shadow by the fact that I went to university with the guy who is now the vice chancellor of the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a bit of a different gradient to his career versus my career. I won't put it solely down to networking or, or having um, focus and direction because let's face it, the man's a genius and I'm not. But, uh, but uh, it does put my own career into a little bit of, uh, a little bit of contrast. Um, um, okay, what would you say are some networking don'ts? 
Gary, start with you. Um, I would say be yourself. Don't be trying to be something you're not. It comes across as false. <clears throat> That's very sound advice. <laughs> Kim? I agree with that. <laughs> That's exactly what I would say. Don't try to come across as something that you're not. I guess, um, I mean, don't try to push something. Like if you're trying to have a conversation with someone, it's just not really working. Don't try to keep pushing that agenda. Maybe try to switch something else. If you're trying to talk to them professionally and that's just not working for you, switch to something casual. I don't know, talk about a hobby that you have or ask whether they have kids. <laughs> that always works because most people have kids and they're happy to talk about them. But yeah, I just think, you know, don't, don't try to be pushy and, and just be yourself. Basically. Yeah. Um, I guess my own particular advice would be don't forget that it's, that it's two sided, right? You know, that it's not just you, I'm talking about at the beginning of your career, but it's not just you as a supplicant to this established person out there you're exchanging with them. You, there's reciprocity going on there and, and you are welcome and encouraged to put forward your own ideas and opinions. You know, I, I, it gives me great pleasure when I'm talking to, to a young person to hear them express themselves well. Would you agree with that, Gary? You know, I mean, okay, fine. I don't necessarily want them going on a rant, but, but I, I love to hear a little bit about them. Yes, uh, that's why I, I tend to ask them more directly and say uh, about what they're up to, what their research is, where they are in uh, their careers. Yeah. But also when I'm talking to people in my industry, it tends to be two-way simply because of the nature of the business we're in. Yeah. But I guess I meant beyond the facts of their life to at some point, if you're discussing, particularly if you're discussing a topic of some sort, getting them to express an opinion can be very welcoming because a lot of students won't necessarily have the temerity to, 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 to jump up and, and do that. They feel that they're a little too early in their career to, to, to express anything. Would, would you agree with that, Kim? Uh, yes, definitely. I think the, it's something that you, to, through the networking and doing it over and over and over again, you start to build that confidence to express your opinions. And there might be something you say and someone doesn't agree with it, but it's an opinion. So remember that you are not wrong. <laughs> yeah. And remember, you're allowed to disagree. It doesn't have to become an argument. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, Kim, before you were talking about, you know, you ask them about themselves and whatnot, and you, you talked about somebody who spoke for 90 minutes to you. Um, <laughs> What do you do after the event? I mean, how, how do you retain at least some of the information that was, that were, was conveyed? Um, so generally, if there's something in the conversation that's mentioned that sparks interest with me, then that's what I'll try to continue the conversation on. And because that was something that I was interested in and somehow it's related to me, generally I can retain that information. So I'll generally, yeah, generally I just try to talk more about those parts that actually interest me because then I know I will remember it when I go home. Whereas the small things where I can't find any association with it, I probably will just forget. But I also like to take notes. So as Gary said before, if I am at a networking event where I have that opportunity to just quickly slip away, if someone says something, I'm like, I'm gonna forget that, but I want to remember it. I might just type that down on my phone. And sometimes when I go home, I have, like to have a debrief as well where I sit down with a notepad and a pen or my laptop and I just write down the people that I met and the things that I discuss with them and try and go back over it again and try and remember it that way. Very well done. And that's exactly what I would have recommended, Kim. I mean, remembering that, of course, at any given event, you're not going to make 20 of these connections. You're going to make three, four, five, right? I mean, Gary will make more. But, uh, but, but, you know, for most of us, it's going to be a, 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 a finite, a small and finite number of new connections. <laughs> Gary, what do you do? I mean, you know, you go to an event, you probably meet 20 people, 20 new people. Yeah. Um, part of it for me is um, a bit of fact finding. In the research area in particular, it's also looking for trends and talking to people about the trends in the research areas they're in. So I try to keep on top of what's happening in that technology field, in the research field. I do take notes from time to time. Um, 
I will take note of, of certain individuals who, who really caught my attention with something I might have said with regards to the work of the research and how it relates to what I'm doing now. Um, and then I'll do a bit of a debrief myself and take some notes and um, use that. And then if, if necessary, um, maybe do follow-ups as well with them as customers. And when I go to visit those institutions, make a point to try and reconnect with those people and have more in-depth conversations. All right. So Gary, I would imagine that at a typical event, you would be handing out cards like you're making it rain, right? Right. Um, <laughs> um, Kim, do you, do, you, do you bring a business card to, to events? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Now, interestingly, I'd like to ask the question, do you put your photo on your business card? Um, so I do have my photo on my business card. Absolutely. Um, I did it when it before when I went to a conference. I had a poster presentation at a conference, so some I'm not always standing there. So some people will come across that when I'm not there, and having my photo on my business card then allows them to recognise me in the crowd later, and they may come to talk to me about my research or anything that came that they found interesting. So yes, I do have my picture on there. Excellent, very well done, and it's absolutely what I would recommend for anybody while they're still studying. I mean, Gary. I have your card here somewhere, but uh, I doubt that you're... I uh, won't have my picture on it. My <laughs> picture's all so that's, that's enough. <laughs> but when, when I meet a student, I love to receive a business card that has their photo on it because it's a great hook. It's a great reminder for me who it is that I met. Um, um, and I'm very visual, so, so having that face on a card really reminds me of the conversation that I had with, with, with a young person. I don't need it for, 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 for someone who's established, you know, Gary and I, we're going to meet, bump into each other at enough events. But, but if you want me to remember you as a student, it's, it really helps me if I, if, if I have a photo to remind me. What do you think, Gary? Uh, I was at the material science conference in Newcastle last November. And because we had an exhibition stand, lots of people approach us and um, ask us questions as well as to follow up and things for them. And I have to say, those students who had a business card with a photo on it, it was easier for me to remember who they were and where they were working rather than just a bunch of names and me taking scribbly notes. So, so yes, I would agree. Yeah. And you've got to remember, for, for, the, for the audience who's listening to this, my, my view is that the purpose of giving out business cards, it's the hook. It's the chance for that person to remember that they met you and who you were as an individual. Um, so that when you follow up with them, because we'll talk about follow up in a minute, but when you follow up with them, it, it, it reminds them who it is who's following up, right? So let's talk about follow up. Kim, what do you do after a networking event? As you <laughs> talked about making some notes and such. Uh, this is the bit where I am still learning. <laughs> um, generally, I, I wait a little while, but... Um, I, if there's someone that I'm really interested in, I actually have something explicit that I do want to talk to them about and I want to continue that conversation, I will write an email and that is how I will follow up on that. If not, Adelaide's quite small, there's actually a fair chance I will bump into that person again and often I will just take that opportunity if it arises to say hello to them again and have a conversation with them again. But that's really all I do. Any yeah. advice would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, since you've said advice, I, I would recommend to students, absolutely, if there's something specific that you can follow up, an email is great. The, the next tier down is to send them a LinkedIn request, but not a blank one, not one that just has the standard, I would like to connect with you on LinkedIn, one that has a message with it that says, it was a pleasure to meet you at this event. I was really interested to talk about this stuff. And I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn if that's okay with you. And then three or six months down the line, I would send a follow up based on what you discussed and said, you know, I found this article, I found this, this whatever, I thought this might be of interest to you and just remind them who you are, particularly if you haven't bumped into them again at other events in the meantime. But Gary, what's your opinion here? How do you like people? Well, how, I mean, apart from sales, how do you follow up with general contacts that you've met? at an event? Um, I, don't know if, I don't go and chase them up on LinkedIn. Um, most of, it tends to be more, if it's more a personal level, it will be an email. 
Uh, but if it's more professional, it'll be more related to what I'm doing work-wise. And then I'll wait and so there's a right opportunity for me to, to reintroduce myself to that person and then further any discussions we were having at the time. And then use the fact that we met before at that event as a hook to try and get to see them from a sales point of view. Fair play, fair play. Um, well, that brings naturally to the case. So if you meet someone that you want to keep in touch with, how long do you wait, Gary, before you, before you follow up? Um, for me, it depends on what I'm doing, where I am. Um, it would at least be a couple of weeks, at least, normally, unless I'm specifically going to be in the place where this person is, because I travel Australia, New Zealand, and if I'd met Kim for the first time, I happened to be in Adelaide in a couple of weeks, and might say, hey, we met last week at this event. Are you, you know, out for a meeting, have a chat about certain things. So, uh, it, but I wouldn't do it immediately. You wouldn't, you wouldn't chase it straight away. But, and that's fine, that would be you, but not so long that they'd forget, because a lot of people are busy, in fact, everybody's busy these days and people forget things very quickly. Yeah, see, and because of that, it's interesting because I don't, I don't let two weeks pass. I, I have a rule internally, not more than three days before I follow up with somebody that I've, that I've wanted to, to, to keep in contact with after an event. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a call to action. It just has, you know, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you and talk about X. So it sort of reminds them of who I was. Um, and an invitation to contact me should they should they want to do so, but uh, but um, you know like a, a generalised invitation to contact me at some future point if I can be of service. But I certainly I certainly don't leave it two weeks. I think that by then they'll have forgotten me. Kim, what do you do? Um, a mix of both. If I can think of the right words to put in the email, I'll send it early. <laughs> but normally I'm the same. I it'd be about three days or so. Like. If I met them on the weekend, they wouldn't get anything until midway through the next week. And if I met them on Monday, I'd probably send it on Friday, Friday morning or Friday afternoon. But yeah, I, yeah, a little bit of time in between, but not too much. Fair play. Maybe I'm over eager. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here's a fun one. How do you move on from a dying conversation when you're networking? <laughs> yeah, we'll start with you. Uh, I don't really know. I hope that someone else comes along who wants to have a discussion with them and I take my opportunity to leave at that point. I say thank you and it's nice meeting you and then head off. <laughs> Go to the toilet. <laughs> That's it, bathroom break. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's exactly what I do. I say I have to excuse myself, nod in the direction and walk off. Just yeah. so. <laughs> Um, and I literally, I, I usually go through the door and reset before I come back out. So, um, all right. How about another fun one? What would you say is the most enjoyable slash successful networking event that you've, you've, you've attended? And again, we'll start with you, Ken. Um, okay. So my, my supervisor is the research leader here at Flinders. So he's actually involved with all of the other academics or, researchers that come to Flinders and he has a little girl so he brings them in they come in on a Friday and they will stay over the weekend and on a Saturday they normally go wine tasting because we live in Adelaide and then they have a barbecue with wine at their house afterwards they are the best <laughs> um, it's at their place it's very chill it's very casual there's discussion about science obviously but it's also a lot of discussion about families and just what you do general day life what you enjoy doing so they are always the best ones for me like the casual chill ones they're, they're the best <laughs> i can see why unfortunately yeah. i don't think i get invited to too many of them and and i'm i'm certainly not making notes didn't find the ones that dave attended the best so <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dave. <laughs> what about you, Gary? What do you love to go to? Um, being a science geek at heart, I enjoy tours of facilities. So my favourite event, looking back, is actually one I organised, um, where we had speakers in nanotechnology, um, food and drink, provided by a sponsor, and a tour of the Australian synchrotron. So the first time we got a private tour of that place was fantastic. And um, I love going to events and open days 
where you get tours of facilities. So I went to NMI West Linfield's open day last year, saw artificial lighting, that was way cool. That was awesome, yeah. <laughs> I got to meet a lot of people too on, on the tour and met some people I already knew who were there for similar reasons to me. I, I would actually have to say for me, and it's quite selfish, but I love the events that the Racky has been doing for the last couple of years where we have a one day symposium and all of the professional people come for the symposium for the day, but then we tack on a, a young chemist group networking at the end of it. So a bunch of established people stay, a bunch of students come and you get this really great mixing of the two. And selfishly, I love it because I actually feel like we're doing a little bit of good in the world that, you know, we're giving these students an opportunity that they might not otherwise enjoy. So I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of those events and we've done a half a dozen of them over the last couple of years. So a little shout out, um, there, there, there will be another one coming up in the next couple of months through the New South Wales Analytical and Environmental Group. Uh, I'll make sure that that's advertised. <laughs> but certainly, Kim, you know, that's something to think about. If, if are, are there any groups down in South Australia, uh, RACI groups? Yeah, we have a lot of them, but they do, a, most of them do a symposium once a year. So I do go to those ones that are relevant to my, yeah. my topic, so yeah. yeah. But I guess the point is that the students aren't necessarily interested in spending a whole day there listening to academic topics. But if, if it can be arranged when the YCG marries up to whatever group is arranging the event, to just have something tacked on at the end, yeah. it, it, it can be quite enticing to a lot of students. Yeah, so that, because I'm an organic chemist, the organics one's the one I go to. We actually have student speakers that speak throughout the day as well. So, and we just ran a symposium uh, uh, two weeks ago, actually here at Flinders, which was all about students. So there was a student from each one that got nominated from each of the three universities and they spoke and then we got some um, interstate keynotes in as well. But yeah, those ones where you have the students mingling in, I don't know, I think they're more interesting as well. Like academics really skim over everything because they have so much research they're doing where a student only has one project, they go into a lot more detail and it's more interesting from that perspective as, as well. So. Of course, I've got to the point in my career I can't go to the academic talks because I won't understand what's being said. I literally went to one a couple of years ago on mass spectrometry and after 30 minutes walked out having understood the words and and the. <laughs> what about you, Gary? When you go to, when you go to yeah, talk, how are you feeling? You don't realise how much you've forgotten until you show up at some of these events and students <laughs> start talking. And you'll go to chemistry, especially over to a natural products symposium, not I've forgotten what I've forgotten. <laughs> I wasn't good at organic chemistry 25 years ago, let alone now. Um, okay. Um, well, a classic question. How many people would you think that you should aim to talk to at a given, say, a, say a, a two hour event? How many people would you aim to speak to, Gary? How many good connections would you aim to make? Good connections? Well, I'd say at most four or five, but speak to a dozen maybe. Um, okay. Some of it's very quite good in the way they're organised in that they actively encourage people to move on from conversations and move around the room. So there might be some sort of coordinated one around and say, have you spoken to this person over here? Off you go, sort of thing. To actually move the, the people around and, and do the conversations, a bit more bright spread. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, good points. Um, what about yourself, Kim? Um, yeah, I would, I think that less is more. Having a longer conversation with someone rather than a shorter one means that there's going to be more points of interest, more things that you've discussed that might help them to remember you. And I would probably only be looking at four or five people. I may talk to a couple more than that. And if I feel like it's not going anywhere, then I might quickly move on. But yeah. I think less is more and um, I'd only be looking at four or five. Yeah. I, I don't consider myself as, as good as Gary there. So I'm, I'm not as ambitious as to talk to uh, a dozen or more people. I, I, tend to, I tend to talk to a fewer number and, uh, and content myself with that. Um, now, I will actually point out, we, we, we've covered a lot of the ground. Obviously, we've been going for, for 45 minutes. We've covered a lot of the ground that I wanted to talk to. Um, but I will invite the attendees who are listening to this broadcast to submit their questions. And I see, um, even as I've said it, the first, uh, the first question has come through. Um, 
And it is a very good question. How do you start a discussion with another person in a different field to your interests? Why don't you start there? Or do you want me to go to Gary while you think? Sorry, yeah, maybe. <laughs> How do you start a conversation with a, with a person in a different field to your interests? Of course, working for Merck, there's no one who has a different field. <laughs> Everyone has um, oh, For me, it's about asking about what they do and asking more individuals about what they do, who they work for, um, what sort of research they're into. And then if it's beyond your understanding, um, then talk more personal. I think Kim alluded to this earlier. They make the conversation more about um, the person rather than what they do. Okay. What about yourself? Do you want to have another go, Kim? I, I think that's my go to. I'd just have a more personal, convert, like casual conversation. Like, uh, if there's anything that's within that field that I know a little bit about, I might try to direct the conversation there. But other than that, yeah, I'd just have a casual conversation. It's interesting because I actually take a slightly different approach. I, I am perfectly willing to profess my ignorance. It's broad and deep. Um, and so I'm perfectly happy to say to somebody, I know nothing about that field. I'd love you to tell me more. Um, you know, I, I might say keep it simple because I'm not that smart, but, but I, I, I think it's, for me, I find that a great way of getting a person to, to talk about themselves because if there's one thing that they love better than to talk about themselves, it's to pontificate about their, their own area of interest. So, uh, so yeah, I'm always happy to hear somebody talk about something that I know nothing about. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, attendees, any other questions? Come on, make it, make, make our life fun. Nothing coming through just yet. Um, let me just quickly, I do have a, a presentation that I often give about networking. Um, and actually, here's one point, you know, we, we, we touched on before about uh, not, you know, one of the worst mistakes you can make is, um, is trying to pretend to be something that you're not, right? Um, the advice that I always give to people, whether it's networking or whether it's any part of the job application process, the, the recruitment process, it's always just be the best version of yourself, right? Um, nobody can ever expect you to be something other than yourself. But if, if you're just going out to be the best of you that you can be, it's pretty hard to go wrong. Um, and I guess the point that I would say is we have multiple versions. Like the Dave that is at home with my wife and child is different to the Dave that turns up uh, in a professional context, is different to the Dave who steps up on stage and attempts to do stand-up comedy. Um, you know, and, and so I just try, when I go to, to, to a networking event, I try to be the best professional version of myself I can be um, with all of my imperfections allowed for. And in doing so, I find that if I say this is the best version of myself, I don't need to be nervous. It is what it is, right? I am what I am. I go a little bit Popeye there, but, uh, but you know, and if people don't, if that's not good enough for people, well, that's kind of not my problem, is it? Give me any thoughts on that? I like your confidence. It's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, one of the great epiphanies of age is that, uh, that you know, I am what I am. I'm never going to change. So if people don't like it, what am I going to do about it? <laughs> I think young people should take that on too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, unfortunately, it's one of those, um, it's one of those uh, uh, issues that, that, uh, you, you can't really learn it until it's too late to really do you, do, do you good. <laughs> I wish I'd known that when I was, you know, a teenage nerd, couldn't pick up girls. I had no upper body strength. So, uh, <laughs> um, I guess another piece of advice that I would, I, I would offer to people is, and of course you are the living embodiment of this, Kim, is an absolutely fabulous way to network early in your career is by getting involved. Say yes to everything. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, I've written down a, a point is to say yes. So um, when I was in my first year of my PhD, some other people in my group were on the Rassi Young Chemist Committee and they were finishing up theirs and they needed someone to take their place. And I said yes. And through that, 
I have met a lot of people and that has been the biggest build up on my network. And that's how I met Dave. That's how I got invited to come on to this webinar and be a panelist on this webinar. And yeah, you just have to say yes. At some time, like sometimes you're not going to be able to say yes. You have something on, you'll be busy. But the more times you say yes, the more opportunities you're going to give yourself later. These doors will start to open. And a little associated tip with that is that, um, look, particularly at the beginning of your career, you know, while you're still a student, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. You don't necessarily have the funds available to go to every single event. But one easy thing that you can do is if you contact the organizers and say, can I help you with the logistics and organization? Can I help do um, name cards or something like that uh, in return for a free ticket? The answer most often will be yes. <laughs> yes. I could have used some hands for some events that I've raised, done, and I would definitely have just said, come for free. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, you know, uh, Gary was talking before about the value of coming to Racky events, and I can pretty much guarantee you, if you offer to help with a Racky event, you'll get a free ticket. Um, so, uh, and that goes nationally, any of the, virtually any Racky event anywhere in the country. Um, so we've had a couple of questions coming through now. Uh, are there any networking events that you would re recommending, uh, recommend attending soon as a student? Why don't you start, Kim? Uh, okay, so the one I would have said is the student conference that we had two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, that was definitely a good one. There was free lunch afterwards and everything like that. But any, I don't really know of any coming up because I'm very concentrated on my PhD and finishing and I'm, actually leaving Adelaide in a month and a half. But there's there's one in Melbourne, which I think, Dave, you might have already shared on the 1st of April or the 2nd of April, I think. I can't remember what it's called now. I'll, I'll check it. Okay. <laughs> Go, to, it? Go um, to Gary and then I'll... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What about you? I mean, there are, are there networking events, you know, coming up in your calendar that you're looking forward to? Um... <clears throat> So I just had the biggest thunderstorm I've seen in a while roll through with a huge hailstorm splashing the windows. I'm not exactly paying attention as I should. So, um, <laughs> so um, I usually look forward to the analytical symposium, the one day one that comes up annually in New South Wales. Because I know I'm going to see a lot of people I want to connect with, but also my friends from other places as well. Um, and, and that's, that's why good... I look yeah, that one's a good one for students because we always run a student event associated with it as well. Yeah, um, there's, there's the Natural Products Symposium as well in New South Wales, which is an annual event as well, which is another one, one day thing. Similar sort of approach in that it's a lot of student talks, poster sessions, exhibitors, and key academics as well. Yeah. Look, I generally like... I, you know, um, any of the smaller Racky events, any of the little, you know, the symposiums, the, the one days, the half days, any of those, the, the dinners and lunches. I mean, in New South Wales, I particularly recommend the, the New South Wales President's Dinner because people who come to that dinner tend to be the most active Racky members and therefore the best to network with, right? Um, and the President's Dinner this year is in June, I think. Um, so yeah, but state by state it varies. Um, as I say, I tend to like the small ones. It's an easier pond to fish in. Um, any other comments before we move on? I found the event. It's called Go Girl Go Global Free STEM Event for Young Women, and it's held it's held in Melbourne. Absolutely. People yeah, aged because... fourteen to twenty five. Yeah. Um, I'll say to everybody, men or women, it is a great idea to be supporting women in STEM in every way that we can. Um, and I do make an effort to, to go to these women in STEM events, um, not to speak, but to listen. Uh, you know, our, our, our profession will be a lot stronger when we have true equality uh, in our profession. Um, so moving on, uh, does it come across badly to bring up the, do you have any jobs going at the moment question when, when meeting a stranger at a networking event? I might start with that one if it's okay. I would nuance the question. Rather than saying, do you have any jobs going at the moment? Um, I would give the person my card and I would say, if you, I'm looking for opportunities. If you hear of anything, I would love to know. And the difference is the question, do you have any jobs going, is a closed question. It has a yes or no answer. The open version is, if you hear of anything, let me know. 
because it doesn't require them to have an opportunity. It only requires them to know about or hear about an opportunity. That's my version. Um, Kim? Yeah, I would agree with that. I wouldn't be asking, do you have a job? I would be asking, do you know of any? Yeah, just a yeah. small change in words, but definitely. And, and Gary, will we'll bring you in in a sec, but I, I mean, I'll talk about an event I went to ooh, three, four years. I don't know. Time passes when you're old. Um, I took a mentee along to this event. I introduced him to eight people and I said, this, this is my mentee. He's a great young man. Um, he's going to be looking for opportunities in the next three months. And if you hear of anything, I'd like you to let me know. Now, on the back of that one event and those eight introductions, we ended up with 10 job opportunities that were sent through to us. And my mentee graduated from university with a job already waiting for him. And that was one event. Gary, your thoughts. I mean, you must get asked this question all the time. I do. It's a common question, especially with people in Kim's situation, um, coming towards the end of their time as a student. Um, I, I, would, I would backtrack a bit and, and say with regards to questions, when you're talking with people at these events, um, maybe use less closed questions as possible. So be not just answering yes and no. Um, leave it open. Ask about... Uh, ask in a way such that they have to answer and not yes or no. And if you're not sure what, what I mean by that, get on Google. Google closed close questions and open questions and you see the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I get asked a lot. It doesn't bother me now because it's happened a lot over the years. Um, my problem is I can't really help because most of the roles we have in Australia are as sales and marketing or customer service or tech support. Uh, the sorts of roles people are after in marine research, they're all in Europe and the US. So. Yeah, look, I, you know, I, I, you obviously speak to a lot of people. I, I do, I still do hear about a lot of research roles. And actually, I'll quickly mention um, EnviroLab in New South Wales is recruiting right now for a casual position. So if anybody is interested in that, they should get in contact with me and I'll help make an introduction. So, uh, um, but, you know, I'm getting... Through my role in in Raki careers, I'm hearing about a lot of a lot of job opportunities, and they do vary. It's much much wider than just those uh, the narrow fields that you mentioned. I mean, but having said that, Gary, I really want to emphasise: not everybody wants to be or belongs in the lab, and that sure as hell includes me. Um, you know, there are fabulous opportunities in the many areas associated with lab that that can be richly rewarding and fulfilling and i dare say gary you might say the same you know uh, uh, 12 years in sales and marketing i would hope has been both rewarding and fulfilling. yes but the key word i tend to hear is postdoc and research so i don't know what they're looking for from that point of view but um i really get somebody come up to me and say how do a salesperson how do i do that and and to be perfectly honest when i was in their position I didn't want to do sales at all. My dad had done sales all his life. I wanted nothing to do with it. But here we are at the other end of the spectrum, and I've been doing that for quite a while now. So. Yeah. Right. I'll give a small shout out to entrepreneurship. I love being an entrepreneur, and I love running my own company, so much so that these days I've got my hand in five. So... <laughs> Um, okay, well, look, I think that more or less brings us to, to uh, the end of our lecture today. I'd once again like to thank Dr. Gary Day and Kim Scroggy. Um, you've both been excellent, and, uh, and I think that this has been a really good lecture. Um, thank you, everybody, for who has participated, and this, this event has been recorded so that we will be um, posting this uh, to the Racky uh, Careers YouTube channel. Um, um, in the near future. So uh, we then have a series of, uh, of webinars coming up over the course of the year on various careers topics. And I very much hope and encourage you to, uh, to, to attend those over the course of the year. So once again, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Kim. And uh, have you any final comments before we, before we wrap up? Kim? Um, <laughs> not really. Just get out there. <laughs> Damn good advice. Gary? <laughs> Uh, just with LinkedIn, if you are looking for a role and, and want to be contacted by recruiters, note that there's a little button you have to push in the settings that allows that to happen. I did it just to see what was out there one time and I couldn't believe any recruiters were contacting me. So it does work. Yeah. 
Absolutely. It's interesting. And just as you were speaking, one, one of our mentees has contacted us to ask about how do you make the most of LinkedIn contacts? Um, there's no magic to it. You know, it's just a case of reciprocity. I say you, you, you give a little now to get a little later. You know, as, as we said earlier in the piece, you, 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 you know, you'll send a message saying, I, I found this of interest and I thought, I thought, the, I thought this might be of use to you. Right? Is that is that it, Gary? But also, if, if pe people change roles a lot over the course of their career, and so every time something happens, it's a congratulatory thing. It might be a birthday, it might be a promotion, it might be a new role. There's a chance to say congratulations, but a little message. I'd say take it and send it. That way, you keep in contact with them. And more often than not, they come back with a short message for you. Yeah, absolutely. it's just about reminding you exist. I mean, ultimately, networking is like farming. You're planting the seeds today for the crop that you're going to reap in a later season. And in between it, you're fertilizing it with a little bit of crap. Yep. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, once again, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Kim. It's been a great event. And, uh, and for everyone who's listening, we wish you success. I look forward to seeing you at uh, networking events over the course of this year. And I will be attending networking events in all of our RACI mentoring states in Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales, and South Australia. Kim, I'm waiting for my invitation to the next careers event in, in Adelaide. You'll get one. <laughs> all right. Have a great one. Thanks, everybody. And uh, uh, we'll see you next time.